Hello, my name is Sultan, and I'm going to teach you how to program in Python. Um, now, a little bit about myself. I have about 20 years of experience in programming. Uh, I learned uh, C Sharp, I learned Java, I learned all kinds of different programming languages. Python, I haven't really done too much experience with. Um, I am still learning Python myself, and I'm going to use that lack of knowledge <laughs> to help you see how I learn something new. Um, now, before these videos, I do a lot of planning so that you can see what I'm, you know, how I'm going through these processes so you can see how you can program without like being overwhelmed. How do you tackle something that you do not know? Now we're going to run through some mistakes. We're going to have a little bit of, um, <laughs> we're going to, we are going to run through some mistakes, definitely some typos. Uh, I am still uh, trying to think about how I want to make this uh, game evolve. Um, right now, I actually got this program to run, um, but I will demonstrate what I've learned for this first iteration so you can follow through and see how I um, tackle these steps. Now, to get started, we gotta ask. Is software development right for you, right? Um, why would you want to learn software development? There's, in my opinion, there's a lot of reasons why. You might want to, um, it's, tr it's brain training, it's puzzles, it's investigation, it's, uh, it's the ability of building something intangible without paying thousands of dollars to build things that are tangible. Um, you know, so like, you know, you, you could just get started right away. And if you are working and you find yourself repeating some steps or repeating some processes or working in Excel or some data in your day-to-day -day job, or you want to get into the career, um, this is a good path. You could work from home. That's what some jobs are like. Or you could work at a corporation with, in some kind of office somewhere. But, you know, it doesn't really matter where you work. You, you, when you start programming, it, your whole environment changes. All of a sudden, things are just not bothering you anymore. Um, so why is soft, writing software so difficult? A lot of people go into this field and sometimes it just doesn't click. And that's understandable. Sometimes we don't really think in terms of code. We, we think in logic, but where do you start? How do you, how do you dissect that logic and how do you write that out? Um, but in my opinion, the best motivation of how you want to program uh, comes down to who is teaching you and how you research. Sometimes it's the person that you're learning from that's the motivation killer. And I hope that I am not the one who's going to be the one demotivating you. Um, I really do want you to succeed and have a good time trying to um, program and uh, trying to have a uh, career in software development. Um, and maybe you don't have a robust way of researching. You know, how do you want to, how do you research? How do you go about figuring things out? Um, there's no law against you not researching. You don't have to memorize everything. Uh, but the more you do things, the more you train your mind and you repeat it over and over, you'll eventually get over that wall or that obstacle that you're having. And sometimes most of the solutions doesn't come when you're in, when you're programming. Sometimes it happens when you're driving. Other times it happens when you are um, in the bathroom. <laughs> uh, these are from my experiences. <laughs> so... Um, those are some of the, you know, sometimes solution just comes when it's least likely to happen. Yeah, you get that aha moment or that eureka moment. So, um, so you also got to have a way to figure out how to be patient when you're programming. Um, you got to ask yourself, what if you spent two hours, are you angry? If you do spend two hours and you're angry at you what you're writing and you're angry and you're frustrated, maybe programming isn't right for you. Um, or maybe you can train yourself to be more patient because you do have to spend hours sometimes just trying to figure out a, a problem. 
And one of the cool things about programming in general is that you can talk to other people. You can talk to colleagues. You, you can always get help from the online or the internet. Um, but the number one cardinal rule when it comes to working is you have to do the work first before you ask questions. You have to start asking, you have to, you have to start, you have to put in the effort in order to do what, in order to do the work, you know, in order to ask the questions after. If you ask questions first before you do the work, then you're just trying to cheat your way through. So it's always, it's always best to know how to, uh, you know, what to do, um, get the experience. Uh, and once you get that experience, you'll come up with a whole slew of, or a bucket of questions you can have, you can ask. Um, people can tell if you didn't do the work and they'll point that out. Now, if you spent two hours and you're working and you went through a lot of obstacles and you failed a lot and you're still happy, well, that's great. Um, you are, you have the mentality to handle, um, when things go wrong and believe me, they will. When you program, you are expecting failure. Um, and that's actually what separates beginners from, ex from experts. Um, the difference of experts is that they know all the pitfalls. They know how to avoid those problems. And why? It's not because they studied it, it's because they experienced it. So if you think that two hours minimum is ridiculous, um, then definitely try to meditate. <laughs> so. Um, so now, I will walk you through the process of um, how do you research, how do you break down things that are complex. Um, first, uh, I do something called a breadcrumb method of analysis. So, um, I, you know, I own a company and I have employees who work for me. And, uh, and I also have colleagues who, who I work with. And if they develop this methodology and they really work through it, um, then it benefits not only themselves, but everyone around them. Right. So you first start and you ask yourself, is the content that I'm looking at hard to understand? If it's hard to understand, um, I ask myself, do I understand this? And if the answer is yes, then I can proceed on to the next content. If the answer is no, then you take the breadcrumb, which is this massive complex piece and you break it up. Uh, then you simplify, you simplify by summarizing into smaller pieces or ask questions. And then you then those new pieces are new content. And for each piece, each content that you see, you ask yourself, is it hard to understand? And if it is hard to understand, then you break it up again. And you keep on breaking it down until you have small pieces that you do understand, right? So keep on, re it's a reiterative process. You keep on breaking things down until there is no um, no's when you ask yourself, do I understand? This is how you gather information. Everything came from the piece of, from that breadcrumb, you know, and, uh, and, and then when, and then when you put all those contents back together again, you get that original piece. You get all the content, whatever that, whatever that complex piece that you didn't understand before. All that discovery, that's, that's what the original content is all about. So when you come back and you see that bread or that, see that content again that was, very, that was originally difficult to understand, you don't really need to break it up anymore. You fully understand it. And if you and if you don't remember, you'll you still got your notes. So, this is just a visualization so you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, so the bread is the main concept. It's hard, it's hard to understand. So you break it up. So now it's kind of medium now. 
you know, you kind of understand things better, but you broke it up into pieces. So there's content that's easy to understand. You don't need to break it up any further. But here we kind of need have more questions to ask. We, we, fe we feel that it needs to be elaborated a little bit more. So you can ask questions, you could do your research, you can take your summary, you break it up and then it becomes easy to understand, right? So all these pieces came from the spread part, right? So now, uh, once you have this fundamental idea of how to analyze your content, how do you break up the pieces, where do you look and, and how you do your research, how do you become a better developer? How do you become a better person in general? How do you become someone who can be depended on or dependable? So you start, right, and you ask yourself, what can be improved? So the first process is to do a retrospective. And there's many kinds of retrospectives. I'm taking from, uh, from a process that we use in a business called Agile. And every two weeks, we ask ourselves what went well, what didn't go well, what do we want, right? Um, this is something that <clears throat> I personally love to use. I talk about all the things I didn't have, all the things I lacked, right? Uh, this, this is just a list. You know, I didn't have this. I didn't have this. I didn't understand that. You know, things that, that are in my arsenal that I just didn't have. Then I take a list of the things that I liked. You know, I, I look back and say, oh, I, I really like that. And I really like that. And you could even give kudos to your coworkers over here. You could say like, well, I really like that this person joined me. And you can have this appreciation and sense of the worth that the person is providing for you. Um, and then you continue on with that. Then you ask yourself the things I keep or the things I learned, I mean. So what, do I, what did I learn this week? What did I improve on? I mean, it's fine if you don't have any lists, but... Each time you do these retrospectives, you'll get better and better at it. So in the beginning, it might, you might not even think about anything. But as you keep on going with this, you'll find out that there are, you know, you'll get better and better. And this list will start be populating. And you repeat these steps over and over again. And then the things I long for are, what do you wish you have that you don't have now? What do you want? What do you need to do? So I have uh, these two um, processes. So for the list of things that I like, I get to keep uh, for the next uh, iterative process. And for the things that I lacked, things that I learned, and things I long for, I put into this consider. And the consider is I take the things that I lack and what do I have to do to uh, make it not lacked. <laughs> uh, then I take the, and I use the information of the things that I learned and I apply it through this consideration. And then I take the things that I long for and I add it to something that will allow me to um, get those things. And then once I consider all those things by prioritizing and figure out which ones uh, are the most important, I change my process. I change who I am. I, cha I add it to myself as a developer. And then when you're done, you just experiment it. Experiment. It's fine to experiment. It's fine to check things and see if what you've taken into consideration is necessary to be used for future self. And then you just start the process again. You know, so so you just go through this process and and you know this is the way that you want to um, improve yourself. Now I picked bread making process because I'm trying to stick with the theme of bread. <laughs> So, um, so here's your visualization. You follow the recipe, you taste it, you review it, you change a the recipe, then you follow the recipe when you do it again. So each time you bake a cake, if the first time stinks, you can always improve it. And you keep on adding this process over and over and over again until you get the cake that everyone loves, including yourself. Now, when you're developing, there's a time crunch, or I don't even know if we call it a time crunch. It's, it's the mood that you're in called the zone. Uh, some people say, don't get into the zone, and other people say, you got to get into the zone. Um, the zone does have their, its pros and cons. 
Um, the zone is when you're when you're hyper focused on something and the whole world is being ignored. You you are getting that rudder's high. Um, so if you're in the zone, what are the cons to it? Let's get let's get the cons out of the way. The con is that if you're in the zone, sometimes you don't see the answers when you are thinking something hard enough. Uh, sometimes um, you are neglecting other things that are going around you at the time. And, uh, and sometimes you're just um, burning your stamina. You're getting so tired and you're just looking at code and you're just not, you're just not seeing something. So that's the con. Um, the pro is you get this flow, you get this momentum going. You, you know, when you just started getting into the zone, you're just coding away. You know, you're, you're, you're in this awesome mood. You just don't want to burn yourself out. That's the whole gist here. Um, so when you are in that runner's high, you don't want to burn out your stamina. You don't want to have your muscle cramps. You don't want to go into this dangerous area where you just can't stop. But how do you get into the zone? Well, here are some things that I do. I turn uh, some energetic gym music, uh, especially when I'm coding. And I only pick the songs that I've already listened to. If I listen to something new, then my brain is really focused on that. But if it's something that I'm, I have to listen to, it just become background noise. And then when I'm researching or studying, I turn off the music. Um, another strategy I use is called the Pomodoro Timer. Now, you're watching this, you're going to have the ability of stopping the video and starting it whenever you need to. I'm not going to tell you to do that, but you can create your own Pomodoro. You could definitely look up this technique, but the standard is uh, you set a timer for 25 minutes and then you take a break for 5 minutes. Then you repeat that three more times. On the last cycle, you take 15 minute break. So you're at the end, that means in three hours you take a you took a 30 minute break, and on the fourth you will increase to 45 minutes um, of just break, you know, break time. Just you know, you can watch your YouTube videos, you can um, read a book, you can take your coffee. Right? It, it doesn't matter what you do in those five minutes; just whatever helps you deload. And then in eight hours. Um, you'll have your 1.5 hours worthy of breaks while feeling refreshed and energized. Um, and if you are healthy, grab yourself a stimulant before you start coding. Now, if you analyze this method versus going to the gym, having a workout, there's a lot of similarities. You are giving yourself breaks and rests and intervals for muscle training and when you do this in this way, you are treating your brain kind of like a muscle, even though it's an organ that controls all those muscles. But you treat your brain like a muscle and you'll find yourself more refreshed, more focused when you uh, when you do follow these steps. Now, uh, I wanted to start. I wanted to talk about you know, all of this stuff before you get into programming, only because you need to have a frame of mind um, of what you want to know about before you start programming. Because, again, programming is a whole, you know, mountain of work to understand. It can be very, it can be a steep learning curve for some. But if you have some powerful ways of, you know, being prepared and mentally and physically, you can really tackle any kind of solution you, that get that gets thrown your way, and um, I don't. I felt like I didn't want to go down this traditional route as well of just showcasing what a variable does, showcasing what a method does, or a function or a class. I felt if I show you a working project and we can walk through this code, things will start coming your way. Okay. And again, I did a lot of planning. I came up with an idea. I, I have already a vision of what I want this program to be already. But the first iteration is not going to be anywhere close to that yet. Um, 
And it's not going to be like a game where it has like pictures and stuff. I mean, there's libraries out there for you, but um, we're just going to keep everything super simple. So, the Fighting Dojo. Oh, by the way, um, <laughs> this is Miro. Uh, it's a collaborative tool. I use it for our teams and stuff. So, um, you know, they give you three templates. I love this template so much. I love uh, using this uh, tool. Um, I, I definitely recommend um, you go use their product. It's free for only three templates, but uh, I have a paying application. I pay for the service, and I absolutely love it. Um, anyway, the Fighting Dojo. Uh, the program simulates a battle where two fighters, namely the player and the enemy, attack each other alternate, alternately until one of them is defeated. Their health drops to zero or below. So here's the execution. On running the program, the player and enemy will keep attacking each other in turns. The outcome of each attack depends on random probabilities, specifically whether the defender can dodge or block the attack. The battle continues until the health of either player or the enemy drops to zero or below, at which point the program announces the, defeat part, the defeated party. Uh, do you see how I started off this application? I started off with explaining what the goal of this project is. If you have no goal, start defining your goal. <laughs> uh, start defining the description of your project that you wanna start. Um, here's where we get into a little bit of descriptions. We have constants, constants. Um, so constants are data that remain, that remain the same throughout the application. So it's something that will define the game. So for example, um, it defines the advantages a fighter gets per level for specific attributes. For the level advantages, uh, it doesn't matter where you are in the game, it doesn't matter how strong you are, these are set values. And having set values is what will help you know, compare what your play, what the player, where the player is, and how far they've gotten in the game. It, it gives you sources of measure. So I have health, I have damage. So if I if I'm an expert, you know, if I'm on an expert, this level of damage will not change for that expert level. Um, training energy cost. That's another constant defines how much energy is expended from the fighter's training energy reserve when they train in specific attributes like strength or stamina. So these are, again, constants. These are constant uh, values, right? So there's nothing too uh, different than how we normally speak. Uh, fighter class. Now, when we talk about programming, we talk about what a class is. Now, Python uh, can be functional, but it can also be something called object-oriented. And when we say something that's object-oriented, we are really defining how we organize our code. Okay. Now, over the years when we program, we spent a lot of time. And what, when, I, when I say we, I mean like the whole community in terms of generation after generation from the 70s to the 80s to the 90s to the 2000s, 2010, right? We are always trying to find ways to organize our code better and better and better. We want to find ways to make our code predictable. So when you are looking at a good code from a developer and you see another person's code and they're both good they are developing a strategy that are similar right so that you can actually look at these code without having to go off into the ether of the internet and figuring out what these code what the code is doing so object oriented um, has different kinds of patterns that are adopted through programming applications. And when you understand these patterns, then you can have this recognizing, you can recognize what the pattern is doing. 
Um, but at the basic level of an object oriented is a class. Now, we didn't get into types yet, but um, because this is a practical thing, uh, we, you want to think of the project conceptually. Uh, you want to think in terms of ideas. You don't want to think in terms of templates. Now, I, I call this a fighter class because that is what it is. It's, there's going to be a fighter in this game. And what will the class do? It will contain a package of all the properties that defines what a fighter is. I am defining a fighter. And what does this fighter have? He has a name. He has a base health. He has a current health which has the maximum and current health of the fighter, respectively. The fighter also has power, which, dam which is the damage a fighter can inflict. The fighter has stamina, represents the fighter's endurance, which is not actively used in the current code right now. Um, the fighter can dodge, which is the probability that the fighter will dodge an incoming attack, and a block, which is the probability that the fighter will block an incoming attack. Uh, the fighter will have training energy, um, level, achievements, right? It's typical. I mean, if you want to think of like what an animal is, eyes, legs, hands, tail, right? And the tail could be, yes, could be true or false. Not all animals have them. But that's what I, that's what you mean. When you, when you talk about programming, when you talk about object oriented, define all nouns. Figure out all the entities that will belong on your, on your object and your program. And when you think in terms of that, you're defining what that is. And even if you're not programming, specking it out like this and giving it to other developers to do the work for you will save them a whole lot of trouble. Um, because it's something that they understand. Now, methods. The difference between a method and a class is that a method is the verbs. What can this fighter do? What can, what is the what is the possibility that this fighter can what happens to this fighter? So this fighter has the apply level advantages, which increases the fighter's health based on your level. So that's a verb. They can train. You can enhance a fighter's specified attribute like strength at the cost of some training energy. And then they can attack. They can attack an opponent. The, fighters, the fighter will attack an opponent who might dodge or block the attack. Depending on the outcome, either the opponent or the attacker takes damage. And then the attacker can earn achievement, which is, you know, they gain a title. Add an achievement title to the fighter's achievement list. Okay, so methods are functions or verbs that the fighter can do. So where a class... And by the way, classes also have methods. So when we talk about the full thing, uh, so we have attributes and methods. Both of these apply to the fighter class. Right? I apologize if, if that was a little confusing to you, but all the methods and the attributes will be in the fighter class. Okay. So going back, uh, the main function of the application is we're going to create two fighters, and each fighter will have their own set of attributes and their own set of methods. They're both going to be the same fighter with their own different parameters. Like, um, for example, you know, I could be fighter one, which will have level three, and I know that my opponent is a fighter, and they will have a level as their own as level five or one or two, right? So the difference is that we're defining what a fighter is. You have two different fighters, and each fighter will have their own values that will represent the attribute that they have. Uh, another another one is name, right? A fighter will, fighter one will have a name. Uh, you'll give it the name of Sultan, right? And then the other fighter will have a name called. Um, you know, ge generic enemy one, or Bob, or James, or whatever you want to call that fighter, right? So that's the game, and the that's the general gist of this game.
Now, if you're, you know, uh, because I'm coming from a Microsoft workshop, I prefer to use Visual Studio Code, or sorry, Visual Code, um, which is this program. It's a uh, IDE. So Python encourages you to use something like PyCharms or some other IDE. You can feel free to use like JetBrains is another one, I think. Um, but I'm going to use Visual Studio Code. And you could download this from the Microsoft.com site. You could just type in Visual, visual Code. I keep on calling it Visual Studio. Is it Visual Code or Visual Studio Code? So you can get this Visual Studio Code and download it. It's pretty lightweight. And, um, and also you have to download the Python uh, programming language itself. So if I go to find a Python download, so you just download whatever Python here. And if you go to the IDE, each IDE, uh, whatever you pick, will do a search to find if Python isn't already installed. And if it's not installed, it'll, it'll help you install it or download it to install, um, depending on the IDE. In my case, it was very easy. I went over here, it told me Python could not be found. And because it couldn't be found, it gave me a link to download it. And as soon as I downloaded it, Visual Studio Code was able to figure out that this is you know, uh, a Python file. And the reason why it knows is because I have this file called fightingdojo.py. So Visual Studio Code helps me find out that this is Python just by looking at the file extension. Okay. Now, again, I've already wrote all of this code beforehand. Um, I don't want to be wasting your time and figuring out how to find something. Um, I also recommend a site called w3schools.com. Uh, they have a lot of references, so you can put in code inside of that site, and you can run it to see if your code is correct and interpret it and see how the things run. Now, I don't want to showcase this the, the website to you because I don't want to... Um, I'm a little hesitant on how third-party uh, companies and showing things work on YouTube. This is uh, obviously my first YouTube video, and I would like to... Uh, make things very basic and uh, direct you on how to research this on your own, right? So the first line of code that we're going to run is called import random. Okay, so import random, uh, what does that mean? Random is a library that Python offers. It allows you to find a random number. Notice I don't, I'm not writing a function. I'm not creating something. I'm just using something that someone else wrote. Now, mind you, that Python is written by a lot of people. And what they do is they provide a lot of helper functions that we could use. So if I don't want to write my own functions, I could always write functions that other people have written that I could use. That's the benefit of the community. So if I wrote a function that I felt is generic enough that's abstract enough, I can create a library that I can send to someone else and they could pull it into their own code and then they can buy me a cup of coffee. <laughs> so um, that's, that's how uh, these communities work. So I don't know anything about the random uh, code. I just know that it, it exists. And when I tried to find um, how to write random number generator in Python, that's how I found out. I found out by Googling it, right? Uh, then I learned that a pound sign followed by a, followed by the um, uh, le uh, letters over here, you'll notice that these are comments. These are, comments are me telling the other developers what I'm going to, I'm going to write. It's kind of instructional, but the code interpreter is going to skip it. So it's not going to include it into the, into the um, output of the programming language. 
It's just for developers to talk to other developers, telling us what this function is without really digesting into it. Um, so I'm going to say these are these. The next bit of code is going to be base constants, and I'm going to define advantages for different attributes when oops when a fighter levels up. Okay, and then uh, I'm going to develop. Uh, so Python. I also looked up Python community and see how uh, what's the normal practice for creating a constant. Uh, and it's all going to be uppercase code. So there is no pound. So I'm going to uppercase all this stuff. Level advantages like that. And if you hover over, uh, so this is not defined, so I have to define it. And the way you define it is by having these curly braces. Now notice that that squirrely thing went away. That's just telling me that this is that this uh, constant is just empty. Now, um, another term is <laughs> dictionary. So what's a dictionary? A dictionary is key value pair. Um, you'll notice what I, uh, you know, as, as soon as I write it down, it's going to just hit you like, okay, key value pair. Um, so I'm going to have something called hits. These are, this is just syntax. I learned this when I was looking over um, how to write my constants. 0 0.05. These are arbitrary, by the way. I just um, wanted to have some kind of uh, values in there, uh, something that can work. Um, so if, if you are wondering why I'm putting 0 0.5 and 0 0.10, it's again just arbitrary. You could pick up your whatever numbers you want as long as it makes sense to the game, right? Uh, then I have damage. So a dictionary is a collection of key value pairs. Your, my key is uh, a string. Um, to you, it's a word. You, you're saying, oh, that's a word with single quotes. But in development, we call it a string. Why? We call it a string because of these characters. So every single letter you see here is a character. That's H is a character, I is a character, T is a character, S is a character. And when we put these single quotes, these are a string of characters. That's why we call them strings. And with strings, you can do all kinds of cool stuff. You can add them together, and you can modify them, you can change them. And strings have their own set of functions. Um, functions, again, are verbs on what you can do on top of these strings. Uh, Python gives a whole uh, library for that. And 0 0.05, this is a um, decimal float. I don't know. There's just many different words that describes them. But just for our case, they're just numbers with a decimal. Uh, sorry, I'm going to give this 0 0.5. Uh, so we're going to give this with stamina like that. Uh, one, 10, like that. Then we have dodge. It's going to be 0 0.05, and then we have block, which is going to be 0 0.05. And Jorge, you actually written your first defined variable. Again, we call these variables, these are constants. Variable, sorry, we're not calling them variables yet. Let's keep the distinction clear. <laughs> so these are constants. We defined our first Python item, constants. So whatever this is, it will represent this entire set. Okay, it's all going to be stored inside of this. Inside of this. Now you know what a database is, right? A database is something that stores values. A database is something that stores things. You know what boxes are, right? Boxes are things that hold values, hold items. When you run a program and it's running, it's like its own internal set of data. It's like its own set of 
boxes. It's like having its own set of collection of things that are going to be available to you later down the line as long as the program is running. Okay, keep that in mind. So right now I'm defining here what exactly will go into this box. Okay. So let's continue. So we're going to define the training energy cost for each attribute. And then we're going to keep the same, uh, the same, um, <laughs> the same uh, dress as the um, other ver as, a, as the other item here. Uh, so we're going to call this with capital letters training energy cost equals. Now you might notice like, oh, why am I putting an underscore? Well, if you do that, you're you're telling Python that these are two different things. So you want to connect them together. Uh, if you do something like this, uh, this minus this is a minus so it's like it's we're telling Python that we're gonna take whatever is in training energy minus cost right so because I I'm really familiar with some of these nuances I knew that I can't use um, you know minuses or plus or or equal um, because Python treats them very different but underscore is safe. It doesn't have its own operation. It doesn't have its own function and utility. So by using underscore, it will act as a glue for my, for these words, these capitalized words. And I'm being very descriptive in them. So you know that when I'm looking at this, that I know that training energy cost defines training energy cost. Right? So then we're going to have strength. Right, 20, and stamina is 15. Oh, and uh, as you notice that there's a red squiggly line here, your dictionary should be separated with a comma, right? And then you could add um, more training types there, but right now we're gonna just keep everything the way it is. So, you know, again, this might be overwhelming for you. You might be thinking, you know, how how do I know where something goes? Um, you know, again, it's all defined before you start writing. You have to define what you want to do. You want to define your ideas. You want to pick a colleague. You want to you want to write ideas as much as possible. Just just if you have an idea, just write it down, write it down, write it down, write it down. That's what I was doing. I spent at least three hours doing this. Okay. And um, I didn't have anyone with me. I just, just kept on doing it and um, just kept it with my, for myself, writing all these notes and then compiling and then moving around and seeing what makes sense. So um, the next part is going to be defining our class. Okay. Now I looked this up and I, and I went to Google and I tried to figure out what it, how do you define, how do you define a class? And this is how Python does it. So you start off with class, notice this dark blue. So it recognizes what class means. Then you put in the class name. So it's green and you put a semicolon. Okay, notice where my, when I hit enter, look where the cursor is. It's not over here, whoops, it's not over here, it's over here. Python is an indenting language. That means that when you indent something, it will know based on the context and based on the position, what that piece means to it. I know it's hard to define or describe it, but when you see how I write it or see how I write things, you'll know what these things belong to. So the next thing is define and then underscore, underscore. Look at this. If I put an I, that comes up immediately, right? 
wow, I just clicked it and it just filled up a whole bunch of things for me. But I don't want to show you that. <laughs> uh, I want to show you what I've learned. <laughs> so self parameters, okay. Uh, a parameter is, okay, so you have a function, right? Um, so a function like, uh, let's say that I'm walking with shoes, okay? If I don't send in a parameter, I'm just walking barefoot, okay? Uh, but what if, if I want to change the way I walk by sending shoes in to the way I walk, right? Type of shoes. Uh, it could be sneakers, roller skates, um, sandals, uh, winged shoes. Uh, regardless of what shoes you wear, it changes the way you walk. And that's what a parameter is. A parameter is this thing that can influence your actions. And in Python, we call them methods. Uh, it's synonymous with functions. Um, so that's, uh, and, and it's also synonymous with methods. So actions, functions, methods, they're all, they are all used to describe the verbs of your, um, of your uh, class. So I, you have to put a, uh, a, a colon there as well because that's how it defines the pieces of the class. And it is a little complex, but here's my next, um, I'm gonna show you that this is a constructor method that initializes class attributes. Uh, you don't have to follow me um, when I do these, when I do this code. I'm sorry if I, that I'm saying this too late. Um, but what I want you to do is I want you to just sit back, sip your coffee, watch what I'm doing, take your notes, and um, in the beginning, it's not going to make sense to you, of course, because this is new, but you're in research mode. You're, you're in studying mode. Uh, just following with me along is going to ruin your active brain. <laughs> and gonna set you into passive mode. What you wanna do is think actively. What you wanna do is question, why is that semicolon there? Or why is that colon there? Or why is that comma there? Why are those things being separated? What does he mean by dictionary? What does he mean by key value pairs? What does he mean by in it? Uh, I also learned that in it, and I'll just tell you from my research, that in it is a constructor, uh, which is used to initialize the class attributes when the object is created. What does initialize mean? Why are we using the word initialize? Initialize is you have a uh, variable or, actually, here it is. This is initializing. I am initializing that. Initial, right? Think of it, initial. What's initial, the first thing, the first definition of this, the first thing that we're doing to this variable. And when we initialize here, we're initializing the class, okay? So what are what are some of the things that we're initializing? We're gonna initialize the self attribute one equals value one. So we have all these values coming in, okay? Don't mind the squiggly yet because this is just a, this, um, I'm just demonstrating the template of, a, of what a class is. So you can see how, um, how this works equals value two and then we have we're going to define methods method one self parameters right and then you know your definition goes here right and then you have define method two self parameters and you know same thing uh, I don't know what I just did, but <laughs> something happened. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what that ha what happened there, but um, goes here. okay. And uh, if you recall, uh, that's what we defined here, right? Here's our methods. Here's our attributes. You could literally just copy this, pull it in some notepad, and and refer to this whenever 
you feel that you can um, you want to create your your own class and that's that's actually another point I want to bring up is when you do these notes and when you write things that work um, and you write and you create your own notes the next time you make a program that you know you want to write uh, you could reuse these notes. You could reuse what you've learned and apply to those to it going fur uh, further. So the more you're, you know, evolving, the more you're becoming a a well-rounded programmer, you will have a your own library of code that you can always refer to. On top of what you can get in the internet. Um, and things are being just vastly more improved now. I mean, you have your chat GPT, you have AI programs now, um, you have all kinds of uh, resources at your disposal for learning. Back in the 2000s when I was learning, I had a big, physical, thick textbook. <laughs> and, and you just have to go to page 500 to see how things are. You have to go to the index to see where the, how, how does this class look like and how does this variable look like. But everything here now is at the tip of your fingers. And with good internet and good computer, you can really um, figure things out pretty quick. So that's how you do a, a class, by the way. So let's define our fighter. So I'm going to rename this class name to fighter, like that. And I am sending the following. So I'm just sending a name because these are the things that I'm going to be changing the fighter on, right? Health, power, stamina, uh, dodge, and block. Like these are the things that are going to be changing the um, the fighter. Now, how do you change? How do you change the name, but the fighter name? So here's a name, and name is up top. Okay. Uh, I wonder if I do this. Will that matter? Yeah, it matters. So do you see that? If I call this, you know, name one or underscore name, do you see how this just doesn't exist? It's not defined. That's because it's being defined from here, right? So I am passing, you know, let me, uh, let me do it like this so that you can see the di distinct difference. T typically, um, programmers, uh, this is an old school way of defining local variables. Uh, new developers nowadays, um, they just keep the same name of what it is. They don't have these underscore here, but when you have these classes, again, this line is really saying, right, I am going to change myself with these new values when you, when you, um, when you assign the, the names to me, when you decide, when you assign the attributes, when you actually give myself real values, like filling out a form, okay, uh, you know, think of this as a form, and I'm just filling out the the blanks in that form. Like, what's your name? <laughs> what's your uh, age? Right? It's the same. It's the same thing. And um, and the self is the property that belongs to the fighter. The name is what you. Are going to be populating so if you're if I'm creating this fighter and you want to call it if you want to call me Bob you'll you'll see it <laughs> down the line the Bob will be passed down to this function which will be passed down to here which will be signed to the to me the self my name as the fighter does that make sense same thing with health power stamina dodge block these are, this set is something that you will define. And I am putting self as, you know, the thing that you are going to be changing. 
And I could literally just give myself any kind of attribute that I want, but I want it to make sense. I don't want to just call it attribute two, which doesn't make any sense. I want to call it something that makes sense. So I'm going to call this health. Again, I could have this, 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 and this is totally valid, but I don't want to call it one, two, three, four. I don't want to call it anything else but the actual thing that will define the fighter because we really, we already know that it has a name, a health, power, stamina, dodge, and block. And all these other ones are the things that are going to fill those up, populate those uh, fields. So if, and, and, you know, you can even think of them as, if you don't like the word attributes, think of them as fields. Think of them as fields to a form. This is your form dot name, right? And this is the value that you are changing, okay? So we have self dot power. And I'm, uh, I'm just reading off the rest of the list to, you know, make it easy. And self dot stamina, uh, self dot dodge and self dot block. So then I'll just copy this. We know that this is going to be health. Uh, we're going to go back here. We're going to be underscore power. Um, over here is going to be underscore stamina. Oops. And it has to be equal. And by the way, again, it's just saying, you know, statements must be separated by new lines. That's just saying that, hey, there's you know, that this this is not a good expression that Python recognizes. Um, this is going to be underscore dodge. Oh, and, uh, and by, when I say expression, expressions are formulas that give back a result. Like A plus B equals C. That's an expression. A and B are your inputs. C is the output. The plus is what you're doing on on A and B to get you C. So that's an expression. Um, in this case, this equal this, that's an expression. And what I mean by equal, I say equal because that's the name of the symbol. Uh, equal is an assignment. We are assigning the value to the field. So whenever you see a single equal sign, that means we are assigning. Okay. So this is going to be underscore block. Okay. And then we're going to have a couple more things. Thing fields that we are not going to change, but exists on the fighter. So the self dot training energy will be 100, okay? Uh, and training energy is not something that you are going to send to the form. It's just the form, again, think of how you fill out a form. This is just information that you're gonna see. It's gonna be read-only. You're not gonna be able to change anything. It's just that the form is just deciding what the training energy is gonna be, and it's gonna be at 100. And we're gonna have the starting level equal one. So again, the start at beginner level. And we have self dot achievement. Uh, how do you spell achievement? Oh yeah, achievements <laughs> equals this. Okay. So now, we have our, all of our attributes, and now we are going to define our methods, okay? So we are going to define our first method. We're going to change the name of that to train. And instead of parameters, again, attribute parameters, I mean, they, they, they kind of work. I'll just keep it as parameters. Okay. Um, if I didn't make it clear, uh, again, you can name whatever these are. You can name whatever these are. It, we, we are defining what this class looks like. We, we're not using it yet. 
it will make sense that these things that we are building, as long as we define it, um, <clears throat> it'll make sense when you start using it. Uh, think about how a new word you just learned. You know, you just learned a new word, and um, you just learned a definition. Um, it doesn't make sense to you. It, you know, it just doesn't make sense if you have the word and definition. But until you use it in a context, until you start using it in a sentence, then you'll be like, "Aha! I get it now." Okay. Um, so if self dot training energy is less than training energy cost attribute. So this is another syntax um, or parameter. I, I call it pro, I call it attribute here, but um, I'll call it parameters. Um, you know, I'm actually debating, I'm, I'm actually thinking here. How about I just show you how this looks like when I run it? Let me put some breaking points here so you can see things. And I'll explain what the syntax is down below. Um, what's going on here? Oh, it wants me to continue on defining. Um, uh, for now, let me comment these out and I'll come back to them when I... This is a really good way <laughs> of how to make your code runnable by coming out code that's not finished and um, and uh, have it have it in a runnable state because you cannot you cannot run Python when your code is not complete. Um, all there has there has to be no errors. There has to be no squigglies. There has to everything has to be pitch perfect in order to, to things to have things run. So I'm just gonna run start debugging. I think this is how you do it. Run and debug. So here we are. We are in hitting the first breakpoint. Okay. Let me hover over this. Uh, can I add to watch? Yeah, add to watch. So if I show you, it will tell me that this is an error because it's not defined. But this is to step, you could step over or step into. So let me move this out of the way. So step over means that you're just going to go to the next line. Step into that the uh, step into and step out out of is best when you are within a function. But when you are running code like this, whether or not you pick this or this, it's, it's going to be the same. So you go over here, and you'll see that this has been populated. Here's your function variables, which is hits, health. Damage, stamina, dodge, block. Don't ask me why it's a function variable. I don't know yet. <laughs> uh, you can go ahead and figure that out. But uh, it also gives us a nice little other function called len, L-E-N, which gives us six. Uh, L-E-N is short for length. And you have one, two, three, four, five, six. It's just telling you that you have six of these, after, uh, of these properties uh, or six of these key value pairs. It's a collection. It's a collection of key value pairs. <laughs> but um, if I hover over this, it'll it'll give me um, it'll give it to me in a data format which is similar to JSON. Um, JSON, J S O N stands for JavaScript Object Notation, and um, it's a way of how to, every website uses it to send things from one computer to another. You don't need to know what that is for now. Just know that this is being populated by whatever this is. And if I hover over this, this automatically shows me everything that's already in this watch. So I really didn't need to add this to my watch. Okay. Um, as you can see here, 
Um, I'm going down the list. I'm assigning the values, 15 stamina, 15 to strength. And I, as I go back up, it's completing the definition of this. So you cannot complete a definition without assigning things first. And then it goes back up to here. Right? And now I'm defining the class. If I go down, it's going to define an initial. Then it goes back up because it just defined everything. And then I get to run the code and nothing happened because um, there's nothing to run. <laughs> I'm just defining my Python items. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> uh, if you want to know how I run it again, I did run start debugging. So I'm debugging my code. If you don't want to debug, just run without debugging and these breakpoints won't be hit. But you want to eliminate these, these breakpoints. This is perfect if you want to find problems in your code, if you want to investigate something that is uh, creating an obstacle for you. So here I go. I am going to um, uncomment those out. And we're actually almost done with our code, I think. Halfway done? About halfway done. Um, so we're going to define our if, and we're going to say print um, not enough training energy. Now, I'm going to remind you, I hope you took your Pomodoro rest. <laughs> Uh, because I'm also feeling fatigue right now. Um, so, okay, so what does this mean? So, we have a type called Boolean. Um, Boolean, what Boolean means, it means false or true. Or true or false. It has only two values. On, off, true, false. Zero, one. That's the most basic type um, we have. And we base on true or false values based on expressions. And what causes an expression? Less than, less than or equal, equal, greater than, greater than or equal. Okay. Here, if you remember your math, is that we have less less than. So, so one of our definitions of our training is if the training energy is less than the training energy that it takes, the, the cost that it takes to train yourself, because we are having these things called train tokens, you need some kind of training energy in order to allow yourself to train. If you have no energy, you can't train. That's the simple uh, matter of the fact. So you have to have enough energy cost to train. Um, parameters um, is, for this case, when we talk about the training, we're talking about, um, well, the training cost here is the, is the array. So which one you want to train? You want to train strength? Do you want to train stamina? Right. So if I have a training cost of 50, right or let's say 25 then i can only train strength and then the strength will be applied to myself again it will be i'll add more strength after i train and if i want to do my stamina and i want a 25 you know for the cost you know then once i spend uh okay let's okay let's go back so i have 25 uh training costs right 25 only when i put it in strength I'll only have five left, so I cannot put it back to train my stamina, right? If I have 25 and I put into stamina, then I'll have only 10 left. So that's the idea of training, if you already think about it. So this training cost is saying, which one you want to train? Do you want to train the strength or do you want to train the stamina? And these square brackets is how you access so this is your collection, okay? This is your dictionary, D-I-C-T, where the key is a string and your value is an int. An integer is a rounded number. Well, not a rounded number. That's, no. 
If you have uh, 14.2 and you convert it to an integer, it'll be 14. It will, it's cutting off the decimal. There is no round. Okay. Uh, if it's 14.9 or 14.2 or 14.5 and you cut that decimal, it'll just be 14 if you could ever convert that number to an integer. That's all it means. There's no decimal points whatsoever. So we're telling it that we only have a value and an integer. But if I do like 0 0.0, for example, and this is a 0 0.0, then I hover over, Python is going to know that this is a string and a float. Float is, has a decimal. Right, it has a decimal. And Python already knows by looking at the value that it's, it's implicit. It's knowing what type the value is. And we only have a few types in Python. And, and what I mean by type is whether or not it's a string, if it's a number. And we have different types of numbers. Flow, our integers are two things we just mentioned. Um, dictionary is a type. Um, this class fighter is a type. Okay, and to reiterate what a class is, it's just, or to re redefine what a class is, it's just a complex package of these basic types. So at the basic level, we have string, numbers, and classes is just a mixture of strings and numbers, and we package it together. Okay. Um... So we completed what, you know, this if. So this if is asking, um, once, we, once we try, once we see this training, once we look at the train, we're, we're training itself, training, we're training the fighter, we're gonna double check to see if our training energy is less than the cost. And if it is, we're gonna print to the console that not enough energy, training energy exists, okay? Return means to exit the function, go right back to the function and send it back to the caller. Uh, when, you, when you write these functions, there's a callee, caller. Uh, and again, these, these principles, the more times you hear it, the more times you see it, the more times you'll understand it, okay? So we're going to write another if, and keep in mind that, again, it's all going to be defined in a training. So we're going to see in the same train if the parameter, um, actually, I don't want to use a plural. I want to use like that. In fact, we could just call it maybe, um, instead of parameter, let's give it a, a better name, right? Let's call it um, training type. Let's, you know, keeping the same nomenclature of underscore first. And let's put it into here. Now, if the underscore training type um, equals strength, what do we want to do with that? We are going to have self dot power equals whatever that self dot power currently is. So if it's five or zero or 10, we're going to overwrite that by adding five to it. So if this is, if this is 10, then we're going to take 10 plus 5, which is 15, and put it right back into this, and it's going to be 15. So the new value is going to be updated with 15. Okay. Now let me repeat that one more time. If I made power, let's say, uh, if my power is 25 at the time of, of, of this line, you know, like I called it somewhere, and then, and, the, and it's, the power is 25. Then I'm going to add 5. It's going to be 30. Then 30 will be assigned into here. And the, whatever 25 used to be here will be updated to 30 as soon as the line executes. Okay? 
So if this is true, if this is something I selected, I selected strength, if I selected strength, then my power will be updated by five. Another way to write this is by doing this. This is, this is shorthand, okay? I keep on putting semicolon, I'm so, that's, I'm so used to C-sharp. But um, self.power self is this, okay? These are both the same. This is just a shortcut. Um, again, a lot of these uh, syntax, uh, C-sharp, Java, the JavaScript, they all do the same thing. Okay. Now, now I'm going to do this L if here attribute equals stamina. Oh, you might be also wondering <laughs> about this double equal. So, um, remember over here, one single equal means uh, assignment. We are not assigning this strength into this variable. We are comparing to see if these are truly equal in data. All right? Assignment is one equal that says put this value into this variable whatever value this is put it into this in fact it would actually make more sense to call it an operator like that i mean if python just did this this would make a lot more sense whatever is in here will go inside here and then you could just have this as equal right that's theory you know syntax but that doesn't work python says one single equal means assignment and a double equal means to compare the value that's saved inside of this variable to the string that we have in here. And the same thing goes with this next L if. So this is another comparison. Um, if this fails, then we are going to check for this. Okay? That's what this L E L I F means. E L I F means if underscore try type equals strength if this if this if this training type is stamina and this is strength does stamina equal strength no so now we're going to check over here does this training type variable which is stamina equal stamina then yes then execute whatever is inside of this so we're going to have self and we called it stamina and we're gonna plus equal, we're gonna, we're gonna append five to it. So when you train stamina, then we're gonna have that. So keep in mind, these are, this is like a fork, right? This is like one prong of a fork and it's not gonna execute this. So if this is true, then just leave, then do this, but ignore this. But if this is true, okay, then, then that means that this is gonna be false and we're going to ignore this and we're going to execute this. These things only get executed when the condition for it is true. There's no way that underscore training type is going to be both strength and stamina at the same time. And by the way, this would be wrong because it's spelled stamina wrong. <laughs> so luckily I got that. If this I would have, if this, uh, if I didn't do that, then this would have been failed. And I would have, I'd be like, what, what's going on with my training? So it, so everything has to be perfect. So my stamina, if I have, if I come through this fighter and I'm running this train function on the fighter and I want to increase my stamina, right? This is going to fail and this is going to pass. And then I append I append five to the stamina, okay? I hope you guys took your break. <laughs> Training underscore energy. Now, instead of a plus minus, okay, 
uh, instead of plus equals, we're going to minus, we're going to do a minus equal. Why? Because we just spent energy. We spent training energy. That's why. Energy cost from the training type. So this training type, again, is 20. So if I said training type is stamina, is, uh, sorry, strength, then this whole thing is going to be 20, which is this value. And we're going to subtract whatever training energy we have, which is, let's say, let's say we have 100. Then what we're going to do is we're going to subtract 20, and it's now going to be 80 as soon as this line gets executed. So we just subtracted um, training energy cost of 20 because we picked strength. But if we pick stamina and we had a training en energy of 100, then it's 100 minus 15. Okay? That's, that's basically how these functions work. And that's why, you know, I, you could work these things in your brain. So without uh, running your code, without testing your code, you, you are, you're really defining your logic based on um, what we talked about once you first started um, writing out this program. But we roll our first, this is actually complete now. This is a complete class. Uh, it has attributes and we have a train. But we, we do have two more methods that we, we talked about. We have an attack and we have earn achievement. So let's write those out. Don't groan. I know you guys are groaning. I said, come on. Right, so I'm going to allow the fighter to earn achievements. Okay, so now I'm going to. Um, oh, actually, uh, yeah. Let, let's just let's just do that. This this is going to be a very simple um, function. So keep that in line. You know, once if <laughs> if you start writing things here, things are going to be so bad. Python does not like it. Python wants you to be exactly on the line in order for it to work. Um, if you really are curious on the errors that Python will provide, if you don't follow it, feel free to make those errors. Feel free to make those mistakes and test the and test the boundaries of how things could just go bad. The more boundaries you test, the more well-rounded you will be as a developer because then you'll understand the problems that can happen if you don't follow things to a T, right? So achievement, spelled achievement wrong. And again, we're passing the self and we're gonna give a title with a colon self dot achievements dot append. Now you might ask yourself, I hit this dot and I get this whole list coming in. Why? Um, because Python loves you. The people who develop Python loves you. Achievements is a list, okay? Um, where is it? See this? There it is. It's a list. We told it it's a list. This empty brackets is saying that there's no value. There's nothing in here. There are, we have no achievements because we just started. So that's how you that's how you put it in. But if I do put in something that says new title. We just added a new item to this, and now it's not empty. Now we have a list of string, right? So now, because Python knows this, knows this is a list, it automatically gives you a whole bunch of functions right out of the gate. And append means we're going to take whatever title we pass in, 
then we're going to add it to this list. So if I give it a, a, a title that's recognized by the game, like, you know, expert defeated, you champion at level five or whatever, and I pass that in, then I'm going to add that achievement to this. Okay? And that's how you do it. Okay, and now we finished. We finished that one, that next function. So now we have one more function to go through, and that is the attack. So we're gonna simulate. We're not gonna. There's no gonna be no pick punch. We have punch, block, knee, kick. Right. We're not gonna. We're not gonna enter those in yet. We're gonna let the computer run the simulation for us. Uh, in the future videos, we're going to start modifying this. Attack between fighters, right? So we're going to def attack. And as you can see, we have, a ho we have something in common with all the other functions. So we're going to define a function for attacking. We're going to bring, of course, the self opponent. Okay because we have no one else to attack but the opponent. <laughs> we, are, we are a fighter, and the opponent is going to be another fighter. Okay? So if the random dot random, okay, I didn't write this function, this came as an import from here. So you might ask, well, okay, uh, Sultan, you imported random, but why did you get a whole bunch of functions for this list? Because uh, when you run Python, when you, when you go into Python, all those libraries are included by default. They're all built in. Random is not. Random, the reason was because we might, there's a chance that we might never need to uh, run random for anything. Uh, list is something that's heavily used, right? When we talk about heavily used functions, Python are going to bring in those heavily used functions automatically, okay? And the only way you could ever tell is when you hit something like a dot, right? Dots are how you get into something. So the self dot achievement exists here. Dot append is a function that belongs to that list. Okay. Um, I know that dots are a very hard concept to understand for some people. Um, when I first started, it was very difficult for me. But the more you see it, the more you understand, the more you use it, the more you see it, the more it will make sense to you. So we're going to have greater than opponent dot dodge. And then we're going to check if the attack, what did I write here, isn't dodged, of course. Isn't dodged. Um, so what's a good way to describe this? Because this is an if, this is going to be with an if, and we, we are going to have an else. Now, as I mentioned before, we have our if, and then we have our L if. That means that, you know, it's, it's going to be a condition, and else has no condition. That just says, if all else fails, then run this. That's what this really means. So print um, f equal, uh, let me do this. Um, f then equal, then within here, opponent.name took. Then we have dam 
damage. Damage. Uh, what you're witnessing here is something called string interpolation, which is this F. I forgot what this is. I'm sorry. This F is allowing me to dump in whatever the variables is directly into the string template. So think of it like, you know, X took a, you know, number, number of damage. Okay. So what we're doing is we're taking whatever the variable is and it's going to be like whatever the name of the opponent is, we'll take whatever damage I gave it and it'll spit it out, it'll spit it into the, into the console, right? And, or terminal, I call terminal and console, for me they're interchangeable. So we have if random, so then we have damage equals, or the, the power, the power that I have is now going to equal the damage that's going to be inflicted into the opponent. Okay. So you see what I'm, what's happening? I'm writing a story right now. Okay. Um, and I have to write all this down because that's because I get to show you what's going to happen at the end of this application. I did not realize it's going to take me an hour and I have to do this. <laughs> I was hoping it would take me a lot less, but I, I do need to describe everything. But see how I'm defining attack? I'm creating a story. I'm saying if I have some kind of random number, I'm going to throw a random number and I'm going to see if that number was a, was a hit. Did the, did the opponent automatically dodge the attack? So that random dot random function represents a hit, a, a, the percentage of the hit that I can do on the opponent. And then I take my power and then I give it a new name. This is kind of like a, syn a synonym. So what I, if I create a new, if I have this self dot power, I don't want to keep on writing self.power everywhere. I want it to make sense to my definition. So this self.power, I'm assigning to a new variable called damage. Right? So if random dot random function is less than or equal to opponent dot block okay and just so you know I might want to create a synonym for that maybe I don't want to have um, oh you know what I do have to do it Oops. so the reason why I so it does make sense so if I call it like um, dodge hit number right that would be this you could do something like this. And then the dodge hit number would replace this. But then you have to be very careful. Don't do it here. Why? Because this is creating another number to see if, that's, if the opponent is gonna block, right? So then you would have to do something like dodge block number, okay? And then that dodge, you would, it, it'd be like this. But I don't want to clutter my code. I mean, it would make sense to do things like that, um, where I would just do it like this. But you could see now that it's getting that the code is getting unwieldy, right? So you gotta so you gotta pick and choose your battle of where you want to draw the line, um, of whether or not you want to you know you want to go this route of just a, of assigning synonyms versus just calling it outright, but for the most part, developers will look at this code and they will not, and they don't need to make that distinction. You don't need to self, um, self document what the random dot number will do only because you're comparing it to the dodge here. 
and, you, and in this case you're comparing it to the block here. So you know that this is going to be looking for a random number to see if the opponent has blocked the attack. Okay? So this is saying if I create a if I created a number um, and it's greater than a dodge, then I'm going to create this damage, right? If the if the number it is less than or equal to the block, okay, then what happens? Then that means that the opponent blocks, and I get damage back. Uh, so right, so if I punch someone and they block, my fist is gonna hurt, <laughs> right? So I can't. Like, I, I have to get some kind of damage because he did a block. It's it's almost like a counter. I mean, think about it. If I block here in karate, they chop your arm, and they're doing it to hurt and to put your arm out of commission so that you can't punch again. So if my number is less than a block, then that means I failed, and that means that the opponent has blocked, and I lose health. So my self current underscore health is damage multiplied by five which is a percent so I get a damage of 0.5 percent um, I get uh, yeah I think that's I think the math is right so then I will just I don't want to copy all that nonsense again I just want to so self dot name oops so self dot name which is me was blocked and took or received damage uh, 0 0.5 damage okay I'm hoping all this is making a lot of sense to you. Let's add some exclamation mark as well. I'm forgetting that too. So we're going to see all of that come into fruition inside, right? So now my functions are done. My attack is done. It defined effect of if the opponent has dodged. What does it do? If it blocked, I get the damage. If and then otherwise, if I was if I succeeded meaning that this is failed and this is failed okay then that means that i uh gave the opponent some damage okay that means that my my attack was successful this is uh uh the opponent on defense and this is me on offense uh succeeding so if the de if the opponent's defense succeeded then i am liable to getting the damage or receiving no damage and if my attack was successful and the defense failed then the opponent took damage from me and we're going to keep on doing it until the health is zero okay so we're going to define the main function. Now, this is where everything comes together. Now, some people might argue, why didn't you do this first before you, um, why didn't you write this function out first? Um, because then I feel like, uh, you know, there's there's pros and cons to to the order of how you teach, I guess. Um, I think if you define everything first, then, you know, because you understand what the, for example, now you know what a fighter is, right? You know all the capabilities of what a fighter has, just because they define it in code. Sure, you could have said, I, you know, well, I could have done, defined everything on paper, then it would have made sense. But look how long it took us to think about the fighter and what the fighter can do. We didn't even test the code yet, you know. I mean, we, we could be writing functions first. That is actually a legitimate way of writing code. If you write functions to test first, um, 
you know that that's what actually what most developers recommend but i'm doing this for the sake of learning not for the sake of you know just writing a correct testable code i'm trying to teach some fundamental values so by defining this class and defining these functions and attributes you're able to see how the, the code works. You're able to see the organization. You're able to see exactly what the fighter is capable of doing. And then you're going to now see how to use it. And now you're going to make a connection. Right? If I did this first, there is no connection. You're not going to be able to see it first. What I had to do when I described this was mock the idea that we're going to use it. Right. So in my brain, I, I had to mock, like, pretend that I'm using this, pretend that I already wrote this function out, pretend that these things are, are going to happen to this, uh, to this object. So the, you have to make a lot of assumptions first. But I, I, I adopted the templates that, um, that has no functions so, you, so I can compare and contrast that how these uh, these templates work. Okay, so when you come up with your research and the, your research and your how to find the scope of your game and how to define the scope of your application, you want to think in terms of ideas. But then when you come up with all your ideas, you convert them to templates, and templates are what's used to have all the developers be on the same page of how to make these things work. Your IDE is very important and crucial because your IDE also helps you out, you know. So I want to see if, yep, see in Python, I typed in self dot and look at all the things that I gave it. Don't worry about these underscore, underscore. You could totally ignore those. Don't worry about it. But look, training energy has train. Uh, the, the cube represents a function. This, uh, Whatever this icon is represents the attribute. It says power, name, level, earn achievement, attack, right? So all these are now ready. Okay, and I and again I did that because I I went to self, I I hit delete and I pressed the button and all that these drop downs came. Okay, so now we're gonna define our function. Uh, so how do we do that? So you define def main function and in python it every terminal or console application is looking for that function main with the two parentheses it's all looking for that this is the starting point of how it runs and and determines what goes on into your terminal it's, it's looking for that because it's going to run your terminal it's going to do all the necessary outputs all the necessary calling Right. Uh, when we when we talk about call, we talk about how one line of call code calls another line of code somewhere else. That's what calling means when you say call. Um, we could always have a line that references a line somewhere else, and that's how object oriented works. It jumps between lines of code up and down the code. Create player and enemy fighters with predefining attributes or properties or fields, whatever you want to call it. Throughout this whole thing, I called it attribute. Maybe it was a wrong way of saying it, but it made sense at the time when I was planning this out. So now we're going to have the first player, which is a variable, okay? Uh, very different than a, cons than a consonant. A constant, <laughs> a constant, which defines static values, two keys that are unchanged. A variable is something that allows mutability. What does it mean to be mutable? Well, mutant. Mutable 
think of a mutant, mutable, something that has changed. Like you have you have defined a value, you like you defined a value to a variable and later down the application, as the application is running, the state of that value has updated itself, has got updated on that variable. Does that make sense? So think of a, so let's make a metaphor. Let's pretend that you have a mailbox and a house, okay? The mailbox has what? Your address number, you know, uh, one, two, three, four. Does one, two, three, four represent your house? Yes. Is one, two, three, four is one, two, three, four your house? No. One, two, three, four is the address of your establishment. It's the address of your house. Okay. Now, is your house going to look the same all the time? No. You're going to paint your house green sometime. Or maybe you're going to paint it red. Or maybe you're going to add a garage. Or maybe you're going to change the roof. Right? One, two, three will still be the same, but the house will be different later down in certain times of the point as the application is running. Does that make sense? I hope it does. So our fighter in that metaphor is the house. The health is going to change. The power is going to change. The stamina is going to change. Okay. So let's call fighter. And now look at that. We have the name, which we can now give it as player one. Okay, or Sultan or whatever you want to call it, doesn't matter. Uh, the next is health, we're going to give it 100. And then power, you can see it highlighted in blue, is going to be 10. We're going to give it power of 10. And then for stamina, we're going to have a 50. And then for dodge, we're going to have 0 0.1. And then for block, we're going to have 0 0.1. Okay. We're going to create another fighter. And that's going to be your opponent. And this, or let's call it enemy. I called it enemy in my thing. This is your enemy. And it's going to have the same as me. And again, they both can attack. They both can defend. They both can earn achievements. They both can train. And they both have the same attributes. Now we're going to start. So this is going to be an advanced principle of, pro of Python programming. Uh, one of the coolest advantages of programming is the ability of going in loops, repeatability, looping, automatically cycling through your code, keep on going until something is false, okay? Um, so just like how we talk about an if statement, which only executes something based on whether or not it's true or false, that result, that based on the truth, will only occur one time. In a loop, as long as something is true, it's going to keep on working until it turns into false. So while, see uh, we have a pink while, player.current underscore health is greater than zero and so we have ands and ors, okay? Enemy dot current health, oops, current underscore health is greater than zero, okay? Then the game is going to keep on going until the health goes below zero or equal to zero, okay? Now, this is a logic course. Um, when you work with logical ands and ors, uh, ands mean as long as both sides equal to true, both expressions on both sides of the and operator equals true, then the whole thing is going to be true. But if only one of them is false, then the whole thing is false. Similar to or, 
if one of them is true, then the whole thing is true. The only time it will be false is if both of them is false. Okay? If you forgot that, you could easily Google that out. Look up logical and logical or in programming. If you, you could look it up in JavaScript, C Sharp, Java, Ruby on Rails. <laughs> they all have this. Okay? They all follow that logic. In C Sharp, uh, we use this for or. Okay? And for an ampersand for and. But in Python, we spell it out. Okay? So, if while the player health is greater than zero, and the enemy is greater than zero, then the game will keep on continuing until they both run out of health. Okay? So we want to make sure we indent. indent. I use tabs or four spaces. So one, two, three, four. Okay? It automatically recognizes it after four, space, four white spaces. So if I hit this, you'll see that that little white uh, that line comes out players take turns uh, attacking each other players so player attack enemy so the player so out we will attack first so if the enemy I keep on doing a parentheses, so I'm so used to C sharp. If enemy dot current health is less than or equal to zero, make sure, by the way, when you're doing your loop, make sure you have a way to get out of that loop, otherwise it's gonna go forever. You want to make sure that whatever variable you have in your condition Okay, you have two variables. You have this parameter, attribute, field, var variable, right? Make sure you whatever you have in here will exist in the body to fail it. Okay? So if the enemy dot current health underscore equals zero, okay, then we will first print F enemy dot name is defeated by the way speaking of stamina I'm running out of stamina <laughs> right is defeated and then um, Python gives you this keyword that says that um, because this enemy's health is below zero break out of this loop just break out. Just get out of it. Don't even don't even bother checking for that again. Don't don't check for this again. Okay. Um. Oh, remove my semicolon. Um. I'm gonna do this, and then we're going to have enemy will attack the player. So see this attack over here? So player, my, the, the opponent of the player is the enemy. And then it will run through this logic. The opponent of the enemy is the player and then it will run through this logic. Okay. And then we're done with that function. So this function creates two fighters. It'll go through this loop, and then it will keep on running until an enemy is defeated, or um, here, player, until a fighter, one of the fighters, are defeated. Just back and forth. Then we're going to check. If the script is being run as the main program, 
So if underscore underscore name underscore underscore equals equal equal uh, main underscore underscore then start the game. By the way, I copied this code from somewhere else <laughs> and uh, it worked. <laughs> I don't know. I can't really explain this part, uh, but it worked. <laughs> um, main function. Okay. And uh, let's save it. Let's run this. Um, fighter object has no attribute to current underscore health. That is funky for me. Why doesn't it have current health? Um, Oh, I knew we we're gonna run into a mistake sooner or later. Um, did I write this right? Current health, current health. It's gonna go up. Oh. We didn't we didn't define the apply level advantages, that's why. Okay, so um, def apply. This is definitely necessary. Level advantages to the self. So we take the self dot current health, and we want to see what our current health is going to be. So self dot current health right now that probably doesn't exist at this point so we're just gonna do that and um, oh I also realized that we didn't have it up here either current health equals to health okay Um, oh, underscore, there we go. Oops. Oh, I don't need the, oh, shoot. I just realized I don't really need these commas. I'm so used to C-sharp, geez. Okay, so basically uh, I have a current health. I did not give it, so that's why we have this error over here. This error is literally saying that fighter has no current health. I wish that Python would have told me that there was none, uh, giving me a squiggly line at least, but um, it didn't. Uh, when you get these squiggly lines, it's telling you that something is wrong at compile time. And what that means by compile time is as I'm entering bad information or bad code, the IDE will yell at me and says, hey, what are you doing? Get, don't do that. Stop before I run it. Because what I just did was I ran into a runtime error. And runtime errors are difficult to debug because your code looks fine. The code says that there's no errors, but now you have to look and figure out what's going on. That's when you get your magnifying glass and do your detective work. So I just created self, uh, so we have self.health and we are keeping track of our current health. We applied whatever health that is and they're both gonna be the same. So my current health is gonna be full at this health. Uh, this health is going to be remaining static. It's going to tell me how much total health I have, 100, right? And as my current health diminishes, the health is gonna be 100, but my current health might be 80, 70, 60, 10, right? 10 out of 100, uh, 50 out of 100, 80 out of 100. It's and then I can get percentages off of that, right? So percentages would be current underscore health divided by health times 100. And that would tell me the percent that I have left or the percent of, I ha of health that I have. 
So there's a whole bunch of things you can really do with that. So I'm taking the current health, which is at this point going to be 100 based on whatever information I fed down below here, 100 health, okay? And I am going to apply this formula of adding the, everything that's inside of this, which is self dot um, we can do base health because that's, I just added that in. So I think uh, this is probably, it's probably better to call it base health now rather than just health. So that would, that makes more sense by saying it like that. So if I say, uh, I take the self dot, oops, self dot base health. Okay. And then I multiplied that. Okay, and multiplied that by self dot level that I am, which is going to be one. Okay, we're starting off at level one, so it's going to be one hundred times one times the level advantage. of the health that I have, okay? And as you can see, it, it got filled up in here as the index, um, which is this, see that? So that's gonna be 0.10. So, my, so the level advantage is 0.10. Uh, so let me define that again in terms of words that you'll understand. Every time we add a level, we're going to multiply it by 0.10. So if I am level one, it's one times 0.10. If I am level two, it's two times 0.10. If I'm level three, it's three times 0.10. We're gonna keep on increasing that health every time we gain a level. So in this case, it's level one times the point, um, Point one, uh, one uh, zero point ten interval. So one times point ten. Okay, if I'm level two over here, it'll be two times point ten. So we know that there's a shortcut to do it to uh, to this. So I'm going to remove this and do that. And that's the code. And I could remove these parentheses, by the way. That's it. So let me uh, run this again. Yes, cancel that instance and start. Yes. Um, something is going on. I have to uh, figure out how to cancel. Oh, I got to cancel it up over here. Forgive me, I'm I'm so I'm getting so used to this. <laughs> so if, so there's uh, multiple instances running. It will not let me run the code because something is already running it on it. So I have to kill all those um, commands and just run it. Um, okay, so now we have a new error. So we have cannot access local damage, local variable damage, because I have it in here. So this is our first time we're going to be discussing scope a little bit more. Um, let me see. Tough damage. Let me cancel this, see what's going on. So this damage, can, oh. Oh, I forgot that. Okay. Okay. So this is so this whole thing was a little bit wrong. So this is about scope. So why? So this is telling me that this can't be. This cannot access this. Why? Because once, because this damage variable only exists here. That's why. 
once it leaves this code, nothing else, no one, no other piece of code can access this. It's only limited to this block. So how do we change that? Well, I forgot some pieces of code. I am trying to rush this and I just forgot. So basically, um, what I forgot to do was supposed to provide another else, else statement here where I have um, the opponent takes the full damage. Okay. So the opponent will start having its health diminish. Minus equal to the damage that we have. So we have if random dot random under uh, less than or equal to opponent dot block, we have self dot current underscore health minus damage. And then else if if the opponent, if the opponent, so this is going the other way. This is um, this is like saying th this is exactly as if I said this, but the other way. If my, if the random, if this random is currently greater than the block percentage or the block. The, the percentage of block that the that the opponent has, then if that means that the opponent did not or it was not successful in blocking, and then the and then the opponent receives the full damage, which is current health minus the damage, then you overwrite the current health again. That's what this means. But I don't have to write this expression because there's only <laughs> There's only one thing that's opposite of this, which is the greater sign. Because this is less than and equal, right? So if you think of less than and equal and greater, right? So if you have less than and equal, then the only opposite of that is greater. Okay? So you can have anywhere between, let's say that this block is at 6%. So if this is 0 through 5, then you know then this works if it's seven then this doesn't work and we hit this if it's seven and over seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen right if my if this if this random number is over whatever the block is then this will receive the damn then the opponent will receive the damage right so that so that actually gives us a, a more full picture of what we're talking about here okay so um, again, I'm making mistakes here and there. Uh, this uh, is gonna be gone um, because the opponent has dodged the attack. Okay. Um, so over here, we're comparing between the dodge. If the dodge was successful, if um, then the then the pot then the opponent we're gonna try to see if the opponent actually blocked. Otherwise, if the dodge was not successful, then the opponent suc succeeded in dodging the attack. Right. So the if this is if it's true, and this is if it's false. If this is true, if this is true, we do this. Otherwise, print this out. Likewise, if this is true, we print. We do this, then we print this out. We also want to add this other thing as well. So, um, print f equal self dot name was blocked and took damage 0 0.5 uh, damage OK. 
Okay. All right. <laughs> so that should do it. Uh, did I, was that wrong in that one? Oh, this is took. So this is the opponent took damage, not me, not the not the not the player. So the opponent dot name took damage. And we're not multiplying that. Okay. Let's put a zero in here just to make sure. All right. Now let's run and debug. There it is. Enemy took 10 damage, player took 10 damage, enemy took 10 damage, player one took 10 damage, 10 damage, blah, 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 blah. Player one was blocked and then took five damage. Enemy was blocked and took five damage. Enemy took 10, player one took 10, and it went down all the way until the enemy was defeated. Cool. Let's do it one more time. Uh, it didn't say that the enemy was defeated. Um, interesting. <laughs> That's uh, some room for debug, but that actually concludes what I wanted to demonstrate. Um, on the next video, I want to debug this a little bit more show you how the flow works but i just wanted to show you the syntax i wanted to show how to design the development and all that it took us wow to no about an hour and a half actually to write 91 lines of code um, half an hour to explain the process of development um, and how to integrate your work into a project of this magnitude um, thank you for joining me, and I hope you've learned something. All right, goodbye.